thank you. Uh, yeah, it's it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I'll, I'll try to give you a glimpse of basically what happens inside the bank and what's what's uh, what's happening inside our heads. Uh, some of it you may may not like, but in any way, I think transparency is 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 the best uh, best uh, when it comes to difficult topics, and uh, sunlight is the best disinfectioner. So I would kind of basically yeah, really run uh, run the whole thing as we would uh, be having this uh, in, in inside the bank, so that you know what happens inside our head. And uh, to begin with, uh, Ilze already mentioned that the situation uh, probably is a bit uh, better than in Estonia. And uh, yeah, it's nice to start uh, to be a speaker after a previous uh, speaker from Estonia, uh, because I'm still, uh, semi-seriously speaking, I'm still grateful that Estonians uh, for once uh, make us look a bit better. Uh, usually they make us look uh, bad because they excel uh, at, at positive things, but, but uh, for once they have, uh, have made, made us look a bit bit better. Uh, when it comes to uh, sort of uh, the summary of what I'm about to tell, uh, I will try to, again, uh, allow you to, to dwell into the heads uh, of, of banks and bankers. Uh, that being said, uh, of course, banks also make mistakes. But uh, at least my experience, uh, and I have 17 years of experience when it comes to managing risks, is when you profoundly understand the topic and when you understand what was taking place into the head of a bank or a banker, then you would say, well, 90, 95% of the cases, well, fair enough. This is not a mistake. It's just kind of negative PR, or it's somebody that is disappointed uh, with something that is kind of ventilating and being quite negative. Uh, so in 90 or 95% of the cases, I'm, I'm quite confident uh, to stand in front of you and say that, well, if you would know the reasons why that account was closed, you would probably do the same if you were kind of working for a bank or owning a bank. And then there is this 5 to 10 percent probably where you sort of depending on, on external environment, you might uh, run, into, uh, run into situations where banks are kind of egoistic or are running away from risks a bit too fast or the climate is unclear and then you kind of ten tend to exaggerate a bit and make some mistakes. But uh, anyways, 90 percent, I'm quite, quite certain, and this is also my experience when you investigate the real life cases, uh, then it's not about uh, mistakes on, on, on one side or the other. Uh, yep, and just uh, just to begin with, uh, so uh, have you seen this movie? This is, I think, conceptually wonderful way uh, just to get you in the mood uh, to understand uh, what what uh, what does uh, anti-money laundering means when it comes to banking. Please raise your hands if you have seen this movie. Wow. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I would say uh, it's it's more than half. I would say you are already very well educated when it comes to money laundering. If you remember the movie, it is in three parts and it actually somehow very nicely fits also the stages of money laundering. So stage one is placement. So you have some criminals that are doing something criminal. We will come back to what is the criminal definition here. But anyways, you have somebody in society doing something that is not acceptable for society as a whole. And that somebody earns some profits or doesn't pay some taxes and then wants to get, uh, get those funds into financial system. So it's quite brutal. This is this uh, stage uh, number one uh, placement. For that, banks are trying to build fences around themselves and around financial systems. And we have uh, so-called scenarios in order to monitor what our customers are doing into accounts. So you have like security cameras and sensors that are trying to sense if there are some strange funds coming in. So stage one is uh, quite uh, straightforward when it comes to conceptually describing it. It's very difficult in reality. You need to have like tens and tens and tens of cameras all around the customers in order to try to spot if there is some suspicious activity, then you need to investigate the suspicious activity and then you need to understand is this something criminal that is happening or, or, or not. Uh, banks are actually not allowed to describe what sort of cameras they are setting up. I can just kind of give you a, a rough, uh, rough kind of explanation conceptually, but we are not allowed to go into kind of details in order to kind of describe that you have that camera sit, set up there and then, then there's another camera because then criminals would know. So what, what creates uh, the track record of suspicious transactions? Uh, series number two, uh, stage two layering. So this is essentially you have earned your capital and you start to behave as if you are a normal business person. So you start to run businesses, you start to do something that is legal, but you still have some kind of 
links with the past and you'll still have some funds that are coming uh, from from uh, from other uh, other sources it's called layering because you try to create layers you try to separate yourself from the initial crime so similarly if somebody does a murder that somebody wants to get away as fast as he or she can from the murder scene so similarly when it comes to financial crime you also try to create layers transactions you create sort of you transfer funds in the morning in, in the evening it leaves the bank, etc., etc. So you try to run away from the place where uh, the financial crime uh, took place. A second stage is uh, quite annoying for the society because if there are some industries that are uh, basically built on, 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 on financial crime, uh, construction industry is quite notorious uh, everywhere in the world and also in Latvia then it's very hard for honest businesses to compete. So you have like uh, uh, almost a rule in town that the only way of being competitive is not to pay taxes and to create some schemes to pay envelope salaries, etc., etc. So the business that you are doing, you're constructing a house, it's not illegal. But on a sideline, you are doing something illegal, which is considered to be financial crime in order to keep yourself uh, in a shape, competitive, etc., etc., and accumulate capital. So essentially, this is this layering stage. And uh, stage three, this is integration. Uh, this is, if you remember the movie, you start to donate money to church uh, uh, or, or museums. You, you become a good, uh, good citizen. You try, try to kind of completely get away from the ugly past and you try really to integrate yourself uh, in, in, in society in a proper way. And uh, stage three is uh, tricky in a sense that if you have currently a situation in financial world, where banks are looking at old events with the new eyes, then you immediately have those questions raised. So what's the source of capital? And you yourself, you think, well, for five years or for 10 years, I have been an honest citizen. I have even donated money to church or to museum or, or whomever, and I have done everything properly during the last 10 years. And suddenly, bank asks me, so what's the origin of my capital? But that was already 90s. What the hell they are up to? Why they are asking those questions? So stage three is emotionally very difficult because already those persons, they don't think of themselves as in stage one or as in first movie. In the first kind of series, you kind of still understand, okay, we are not doing something that is correct. In the second one, you already a bit mixing it with a clean business. In the third one, you already think of yourselves as a very kind of good and decent pals and then you then you don't understand why 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 suddenly all those questions about origin of funds and this is essentially what bankers would be trying to do on their side they would be keep asking sort of the source of funds uh, what what is the origin of your wealth how you derived your wealth etc etc because the letter of the law actually and regulators will correct me if i'm wrong the letter of the law says that uh, we as bankers we need to understand origin of funds from the first euro. So essentially, the letter of law is quite straightforward. From the first euro, you need to understand the origin of equity, of funds, of all the kind of money that you have in your accounts. Yep, that's about stages. Uh, when it comes to money laundering, uh, I come from doctor's family, and I, I think of it a bit like uh, from a perspective of society. And banks are kind of compared as the ones that are providing blood flow to the whole body. And uh, well, uh, if we are to have a healthy body, then in ideal world, you have an immune system or a bloody flow that doesn't provide any flow to uh, tumors, uh, cancers, but provides to livers, uh, kidneys, etc., etc. And uh, this is essentially what, uh, what the modern world is about. So I think uh, Americans realized it after September 11. It took uh, Europe a bit more years to realize it, but society has realized that in order to have a healthy body, in order to make sure that we don't have any cancers, any tumors in the body, we need to go after the blood flow and we need to convince the blood flow that they are not kind of uh, providing blood flow uh, to, the, to the bad parts of the body. And by that body it in itself will gr grow healthier, there will be less corruption, there will be more honesty, entrepreneurs will compete not on ability not to pay taxes, but would complete, compete on their uh, their their ingenuity, etc., uh, etc., et and uh, yeah. So essentially, from from a society uh, perspective, this is not uh, not a bad uh, thinking, uh, and I'm I'm fu fully in fa favor of that. What is a bit uh, the case in Latvia is currently that well, we are a bit also forced by external events uh, to get rid of those cancers that we might still have in our body in a very fast manner. And how do you do that if you're in hospital? You do this with a chemotherapy. So you inject something externally, 
into body and then you try to kind of bit poison the body with, with not killing it hopefully in order to get rid of uh, of those last uh, bits and pieces that you might uh, might still uh, have in a body and of course it's 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 difficult for everyone the healthy parts uh, as we all know also suffer but the intention is a good one and the only question is why do why did it take so long that we can't live now without this external pressure money wall and all that why do we need to have chemotherapy why did it took so long why couldn't we have done it uh, on our own so but again one needs to be conscious that there are negative side effects uh, to something that is good for society and is good uh, with good intentions. So the side effects, unfortunately, are there, be it in medicine, be it in AML. Uh, yep, when it comes to uh, risk types and factors, so bankers would usually try to judge you from a geographical risk perspective, and I think it was already mentioned that it's not our fault that Russia, Ukraine, and some of the former Soviet Union countries are fairly corrupt. Uh, so the capital that originates from those countries are, by definition, a high-risk geographical risk factor, and then you need to really be quite on your toes in order to understand what's the source of funds, uh, for example, from Russia. That being said, I have also seen in my experience fantastic companies where you can really sort of, even in Russia, uh, verify the origin of funds from the first euro, and they have paid all the taxes in Russia, and they have been squeaky clean. So it is possible to kind of check it and check with the uh, Russian, uh, Russian uh, state revenue service and all that. So the world is not black or white, but the geographical risk factor in this part of the world, by definition, tends to be sometimes on a high side. Uh, then you have customer risk profile. So for example, if you're a construction company, probably you are in a high, uh, high risk uh, segment. Uh, then there are some, some others. So what, what's, what's the business uh, type that you are into? What, what's your customer profile? And products and services. So this is basically, yeah. Uh, are you uh, are you just uh, transferring funds throughout your account and, and kind of do you receive it and then f f further forward it to somebody else or, or 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 are you really sort of placing a deposit, accumulating capital? So what's uh, what's the track record of what you're actually doing into accounts? But we'll come uh, back to that a bit later. And then I'm about to go uh, through 12 principles that uh, we in a bank use in order to sort of try to understand ourselves, so where do we stand uh, uh, when it comes to uh, AML risks further on. So this would be like, again, getting into the heads uh, of bankers, what, what follows here. Uh, placement layering integration, so those are three uh, distinct stages in money laundering. And again, I think um, the ones that are in placement phase, they very well understand uh, why banks are having those security cameras and, and, and they don't complain. Uh, where most complaining takes place uh, Currently, in my experience in Latvia, this is this integration where people think, but well, I have been doing all the right things for the last five or ten years, and how come we suddenly look at the old events with the new eyes and why banks are asking those questions, but before they were not so much asking those questions. So this is where most of the frustration takes place. When it comes to layering, I see a lot of positive improvements in Latvia, for example, construction uh, companies, the large ones uh, themselves, they would be saying, well, we are sick and tired of competing uh, in between ourselves with ability not to pay uh, taxes. We just want to start from a scratch, but none of us as individual company can change because then I would go bust. We all need to change at the same time. So we don't want to get stuck in this layering stage where we do something that is mostly legal, but on a sideline, well, there are some things where uh, where we are using certain vehicles or suppliers of our suppliers in order to get uh, get some uh, some funds out to be paid as cash salaries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so in that sense, I would be uh, quite positive that the Latvian society is getting more mature and is understanding that it is for everyone's benefit to change the rules as we kind of continue to play this game in business, and and uh, follow more more transparent and more honest rules. That is for the benefit of everyone. Uh, tax crimes and bribes are also predicate crimes for money laundering. So again, this is sometimes uh, sometimes felt that, well, I was just trying to save on taxes. How, how, how does it relate to money laundering? Well, in fact, it does in a very clear uh, manner. And just to give you an example from, from my own experiences, for example, you have a client who buys something from uh, China for $50 and then the very next day sells it to Latvian hospital for $200. Uh, the difference is $150 uh, per unit. That is then paid out uh, uh, partly in cash. 
partly there are marketing services, consultancy services, etc., etc. And when, as a banker, I tell you this story, you would probably suspect that part of the money goes back to the hospital uh, administrators uh, as bribes. But again, this is not for us to prove. This is not something we would uh, we would know. But uh, we would suspect that there is a uh, predicate uh, crime. In this case, uh, some bribes uh, might be taken out. And this might be the only logical reason why hospital pays four times more for something that essentially uh, was with a cost record of, uh, of four times less. So, so you end up in those situations. And those would be entrepreneurs that would also be complaining, frankly speaking, in, in my experience as well. But when we zoom out, when we look at it from a perspective of our society, we would say, no, 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 we don't want those guys around. We want some honest and clean businessmen here working and living by different standards and rules. Understand business logic of client and transactions. Uh, so uh, back to this previous example, when you buy something from China for $50 and sell it for $200. So what's the business logic? What's, what's the reason why you are called entrepreneur? Is it because you have invented something or is it just because you happen to uh, know some hospital managers and procurement people and that's your added value? So again, when you zoom out and look at it from society's perspective, I think the answer is clear. Entrepreneur is somebody who takes risks, not kind of organizes things in, in a, in a strange, uh, strange manner. And this is what bankers would also uh, try, try to understand whenever you try to open an account. And I think in this, uh, this case, you would also tend to have sometimes exaggerations where you feel as entrepreneurs that uh, you already explained the business logics uh, and the bankers would say, no, no, I still don't understand why you import those sewn timber goods from Russia then you kind of, without adding any value, you export them through Riga port to uh, US. Is, is it just a trade? Is, is there some profits left here in European Union? Or what's, what's, what's the logic of shipping something through Latvia? So you would uh, run into uh, situations uh, quite, quite often into, again, discussing what's the business logic. Where it clearly makes sense, then I would uh, very much hope that bankers would also not uh, ask too many questions and would not ask any legal proof uh, for, for, for anything uh, more than, than what they are legally requested to ask. But this is quite often uh, from a practice where a debate uh, takes place. Uh, another thing is um, what you do not understand is not OK. So a very simple uh, concept uh, uh, for bankers. And uh, what uh, Bill Broder, uh, the famous American guy who is uh, behind this Magnitsky case, uh, he is presenting to European Parliament, uh, he is quite often uh, referring and coming back to reverse burden of proof. So he is saying in current global modern world, it is impossible for any state to hire thousands and thousands of investigators and then for 10 years to investigate so the flows of money and try to get, catch all the, all the bad uh, people. Instead, he says, well, the world needs to change uh, to, to reverse burden of proof. And Latvia is one of the first countries in the world joining that concept, and that concept means that, well, you don't hire investigators that investigate somebody in Latvia for 10 years. Whenever you have suspicious amount of funds in the account, uh, account sorry, uh, you freeze them, and then you basically, in com combination with financial uh, intelligence unit, you make sure that the customer himself comes to the judge and tries to explain so wh wh why he is the possessor of those funds, what's the origin of those funds, uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, how he obtained that money. And if, for example, within a month, customer is not capable of explaining the origin of funds, then judge says, thank you very much. You have not been, have been able to explain uh, the origin of funds, neither you have salary uh, to accumulate $5 million, nor you have businesses that have paid taxes and have made you able to accumulate $5 million. So thank you very much. Those $5 million now belong to society and uh, we include them uh, into, into state, uh, state coffers. It sounds a bit like uh, communism initially, and it sounds quite brutal, but then again, when you zoom out and think about it from society perspective, I think this is, uh, this is where Latvia needs to realize that the world is changing. The attitude from society and politicians is also changing, and there will be this uh, reverse burden of proof thinking. So if you are very wealthy and if you have a lot of funds, it's not the state that needs to prove that you have stolen something, but quite often it's you who need to prove that, well, somebody intelligent enough can understand what's the source of origin uh, or origin of your funds. 
So what you do not understand is not okay. That's a quite, quite clear uh, concept when it comes to money flows. A church tower principle, this is one of the oldest principles in banking. Uh, in medieval times, uh, bankers uh, would sort of say, well, we operate under church tower principle. We go on the top of the tallest uh, church tower. And as far as we can see, uh, this far we accept deposits and we issue loans. We can't see till the next town. There is another banker in the next town. There's another church tower in the next town. So they service that particular client. And I'm not saying we are moving back to medieval times, but, but in some ways financial system went uh, from medieval times and church tower principle into fully global uh, thinking where we said the money doesn't smell, it doesn't matter from where it comes, it's still money, it's always good, it's always clean. So that was the typical 90s thinking. Now we are trying to get some sort of balance uh, in between that uh, financial flows can be global, but predominantly you need to be friendly with the banker in your hometown. And the banker in your hometown would know sort of your origin of deposits, would be able to lend to you. So this is this church tower principle that is a coming, coming back in, in, into wake uh, once again. Where the money comes from source of wealth, I think we covered that one. And again, just, just a reminder that uh, the burden of proof is reversed. It's not that state would hire thousand additional investigators in order to police everyone in society. State has changed the thinking. The state is saying, okay, dear bankers, you are the ones that are responsible for blood flows in the system, so we will go after you if you would touch any money that you don't know uh, from where it originates. So, so this reverse burden of proof thinking that Bill Browder and European Parliament is discussing and many countries are implementing, that is behind this one as well. And that is here to stay. Whether we like it or not, we might have our own personal opinions but I don't see any, any chance uh, that uh, politicians or society will back down uh, from this uh, quite significant change of thinking. And again, when you zoom out and when you sort of ask yourself a question in what kind of society we want our kids to grow up, then we would say, well, it's actually quite fair. If somebody has $5 million and cannot explain from where, then it's quite fair that this money goes to kind of teachers, doctors, uh, policemen, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not that terrible. It's not communism, again, though it initially might, uh, might sound to somebody. Try to be consistently not stupid instead of being very uh, smart or intelligent. This is with the fintechs and per payment services providers that was mentioned uh, a bit before. A lot of innovation in financial sector is, is good. There's no doubt about that. But again, for banks, they are requested uh, not to be stupid, not to touch any strange flows, not to do anything stupid but uh, yeah and then sometimes we are uh, blamed for not being intelligent enough to work with uh, fintechs uh, bitcoin exchanges all those cryptocurrency things and all that but we are not intelligent enough and we don't have the cameras and the tools in order to understand what the hell those guys are doing and what are those transactions based on so for us the task is not to be stupid not to touch anything that is uh, that is potentially dirty and that we cannot uh, cannot uh, understand. So quite a uh, quite clear concept uh, here as well. And uh, fintechs, with all due respect, uh, quite often you need to realize they are like a Trojan horse. So if we would open uh, an account for fintech that would service uh, other customers, uh, all very good, but we are requested uh, to, to, to have all the AML rules and procedures in place. We are requested to follow OFAC sanction and God knows what else. And those fintechs, they are not uh, not uh, requested, not not even close the same amount uh, uh, that, that that we are requested. So in that sense, when 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 we onboard them and they are servicing different clients, it's like a Trojan horse in our beautiful city, and all the walls, all the cameras, they would just not be capable of dealing what happens uh, inside this Trojan horse. So it is a high risk uh, uh, thing by definition. Yep, character of persons involved makes all the differences and it is a lot about values and well, you have a lot of uh, wonderful and honest people in this country and then well, if they realize that okay, the rules have changed and it is more cumbersome and I also suffer because there is now this chemotherapy and I need to kind of give additional documents and this and that, it is annoying but I would say it's all, all doable if you have all, all, all the right uh, values in place. Uh, then hopefully the whole uh, thing that is happening shouldn't uh, touch you too profoundly. Uh, though it is annoying, I, I definitely admit that. 
Uh, what we bankers would also say that it is perfectly okay to decline a business relation if uncertainty or discomfort exists about the character of people managing the company. And that, that's something we also need to remember that uh, uh, for, for society it's important that there is a healthy competition between banks. But banks are private entrepreneurs and as every private entrepreneur can choose with whom to work and with whom not to work, the same st stands for bank. We are not a state agency obliged to give a health to somebody or, or teaching to somebody. We are a private business entity and uh, we reserve rights to decide with whom to work and with whom not to work. And if we have doubts about the character of the people managing the company, it is perfectly okay for us to say no. That being said, again, I would say there might be some situations where a particular bank exaggerates and takes a two kind of risk-averse position and is too scared from the environment or regulator or God knows what. In that situation, the only cure is a healthy competition. You go to the bank across the corner, you ask that bank. So, and the more there is healthy competition, the better, better it is for Latvian society. So that's the only rational cure. You cannot be angry at bank for not kind of doing business at you. It's a private business entity. It's not a government entity. So being angry is not helpful. Making sure that we have a good and clean environment and many banks are healthy here and want to, co uh, want to uh, compete and want to work, that's the only long-term solution for the current problems that we currently seem to have. Risk-reward balance, so in our case, uh, you risk uh, not only with operations in Latvia, but much more. Our operations in Latvia, uh, when I'm sp speaking about SCB, it's 2% from the total group. Whenever we do something utterly stupid, it affects the whole 100%. So every mistake is multiplied 50 times. So in that sense, you have some benefits uh, uh, for the Latvian market that there are banks that would never ask Latvian state to bail us out, and we are kind of very strong on our own. So you have SCB, Swedbank, and the kind of the more regional or global banks. And the beauty of having us in the market is that we are ultra safe. We would never ask government to bail us out. We would never be the next Parex, Krybank, or, or somebody else. The cost to it is that by definition we are more prudent because we have much more to lose. It's not only the Latvian market, but it's also our global operations. So that's also plain economics. There's no such thing as free lunch. You can't get all the positive things and then skip all the negative things. So in one part of the banking society, you might see some positive things that they will be stable. They would not, uh, not uh, ask Latvian taxpayers for any bailout money, uh, as, as again, Parex or Crybank or PNB uh, probably will end up uh, doing, but there are some downsides. And then, well, in a healthy market, it's nice if you have other banks, you have some local banks that are more uh, able to kind of take take on higher risks, but then we all know that there might be a downside uh, to that, uh, that uh, aspect as well when it comes to managing economical cycles. Yep, uh, this is uh, essentially also, once again, back to this reverse uh, burden of proof that we, we, we bankers, we would say, well, ask not why this customer cannot bank with us, but why should we bank with this customer? So reverse burden of proof. We need to obtain a sufficient amount of information in order to be confident that the origin of funds for the particular customer is clean, the transactions will not possess any high risk, and then, then it's no problem. Then we are absolutely ready to bank. But it's not, not this kind of other way thinking that, well, tell me what is the reason why are you not banking with me? That's, that's quite emotional. This is a grown-up conversation. There are two business entities willing to cooperate or not willing to cooperate. And the question, well, you should ask is, okay, how can I show to the bank that I don't possess a high risk level for them and they, sh they should be then hopefully ready to uh, cooperate uh, with me? And uh, with AML topics, it is particularly tricky. My uh, kind of mo most of my experience is more managing credit risk and other risk types, and, and there it's more static. So when you issue a loan of 1 million euros, you can lose 1 million euros. When you open an account, it's a quite tilted thing. You can earn 10 euros per month, but you can, use, uh, you can lose insane amounts of funds. So it is also a quite, uh, quite a humbling risk uh, to manage from a banker's perspective in a sense that, well, you need really need to show that, okay, this is what I would be doing and, and uh, that's, that's, that's uh, not possessing any elevated risk for the bank. 
And uh, last but not least, so you have this situation where good clients can do bad things and bad clients try to be uh, good. So again, this is just the nature of the game and good clients can do bad things. I guess the biggest mistake what we have seen in Baltics is uh, sanctions uh, risk. Unfortunately, that is uh, still quite often the case where, and we have also discussed it with Ministry of Foreign Affairs a couple of times, you would have an entrepreneur that says, well, but I work in European Union. What's wrong with me sending grain to Iran? Um, European Union allows me to send grain to, grain to Iran. What's, what's wrong with that? Uh, the grown-up uh, answer is that, yes, you can send uh, grain to Iran, but you cannot expect that the financial system can channel the payment in or out from Iran. So financial system is working but under different rules and entrepreneurs are living under different rules. And sometimes it gets even, even more tricky. So we as a bank, if we have anything to do with the uh, United States dollars and we happen to have also branch in New York, we are subject not only to European laws, we are subject also to uh, Uncle Sam to uh, American laws. So when then again, you have a company in Latvia who can say, I don't care about OPEC sanctions, I don't care about American uh, rules and legislation. We can't say that. We don't have the privilege to say that. So and then by definition, there might be uh, some, some misunderstandings in between. And uh, the very last slide from my side, so I think what is uh, the most tricky thing is that, uh, well, when we undergo this uh, chemotherapy, uh, there is a bit of this situation where we evaluate past from today's perspective. And uh, as I say to uh, fellow bankers, there's also this Warren Buffett quote, but as I say to uh, fellow bankers, you can ask your parents, uh, have they been using this child seat when they were uh, carrying you around in a car? Well, my family never had a car, but anyways, if you were using a car in Soviet Union, so you can ask your parents, uh, dear mommy or dear daddy, did you use a child seat for carrying me around? And I'm quite sure they would say, no, I did not use any child seat. And then you can continue, you can say, how, how could you? You never loved me, you were not thinking of my health, and that's insane, that's unacceptable. Can you imagine somebody these days not using a child seat? So again, you can't, uh, what I'm saying, trying to say here, you can't always judge events in the past uh, from today's perspective. And this is also what, what you mentioned, the maturity of bankers, and I'm sure it will uh, grow up. And the maturity comes when you are able to say to your parents, okay, you never carried me in a car seat because you didn't have a car seat. Or even if you had, it was uh, only for, for, for Swedes, but definitely not, uh, not in the uh, Soviet Union. So I don't think you were bad parents in any way. But if currently I would see that you don't carry any kids in, 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 in car seats, then that would be completely insane. So this is ultimately the most tricky thing and where I feel some maturity for Latvia as a society and also for bankers is needed, where you zoom back and where you don't start to uh, reinvestigate events that took place in 90s if a person really has kind of lived a decent li life and pays all the taxes and doesn't possess any large risk for the bank during last 10 to 15 years, I would say that's probably okay. Though again, back to the letter of the law, the letter of law says uh, you need to investigate the source of funds from the very first euro. So the maturity kicks in where you start to have this debate in your head. Thank you very much. That's it from my side. Thank you.